Hello, everybody. This is Keith Yamamoto filling in for Doug Bruner, and we're here on The Toast. I'm lucky enough today to be joined by Mal- my- <laughs> Mike Alamari from Pacific Farm Management, uh, Bo Diaz from Barrier Solar, and Joshua Dow, Ag Center's proud uh, oh. member, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> local legend. <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, local legend, and he's the ag water guy, and he works for uh, Water and Land Solutions. So today we're here to talk about sustainability in ag. Uh, it's um, it's become and has been a pretty hot topic over the last. Uh, it's probably been a good decade or more now, and it's important, you know, for everybody in agriculture, um, you know, and that's like a buzzword, sustainability, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes we we use words like that, and then we don't really think about what it all means. So I think with the group that we have here today, um, I think the listeners will get a pretty good perspective of uh, how sustainability is uh, being addressed and how it's being addressed by different sectors in the ag industry. Um, But real quick, you know, for everybody, you know, what is sustainability in ag? And, you know, sustainability is just being able to sustain agriculture through the test of time with the resources um, that we have available to us, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't um, burn through everything that we've got given to us on the earth and, um, you know, burn through people, burn through our resources, you know, burn through our fi- all of the financial uh, resources we have as well. So um, in the room, you know, obviously Barrier Solar is pretty self-explanatory. Water and Land Solutions um, does a lot with uh, water resource and uh, natural resource. And then, you know, Mike over here with Pacific Farm Management, uh, his resource is human resource, which is... Uh, equally, if not the most important resource of every of everything that we have available to us, you know. So, you know, we're going to talk about the different things within uh, sustainability here. And you know, first, I'd like to open it up and uh, let each one of the guests here introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves, and um, then we can get started on our our topic for the day. So, you know, Bo, go ahead. Yeah, how we doing? I'm extremely excited to be here and. Appreciate you guys having us. Uh, my name is Bo Diaz, and I, uh, I work at Barrier Solar. Um, I grew up here in the valley. Um, I've been at Barrier for about four years now, um, and we specialize in solar for agriculture, um, which has is, is been absolutely awesome, but very challenging at the same time. Um, so that's, that's what we do. Most, most, of our, most of our projects are specifically you know, tailored around uh, water pumps, uh, processing facilities and really every type of agriculture you can think of. Um, so that's you know what we what we focus on. Um, but me myself, like I said, I'm from here in the valley, and I, you know, obviously the agriculture roots run deep here, and it's something that's that's important to everybody, regardless of what you know walk of life you're from or what business you're from. Um, so you know it's something that's extremely important and something that been fortunate enough to to be a part of. So sweet, Mike. Yeah, Mike Alamari with uh, Pacific Farm Management. So I started that company um, going on eight years now alongside with a supply company. I mean, both catered ag. Uh, probably never thought in a million years I'd be doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to college, was going to be a lawyer, but hey, decided let's let's start a business and see where it goes. Yeah. But just like God. he said, I like what he said. It's, it's awesome, but real challenging. Every year there's always something new. Um, but yeah, I, I think sustainability is a really important issue that that uh that everyone has their mind on right now sure great josh perfect yeah so i'm i'm josh dowell uh apparently i'm a director you know of fun at the ag center all that good stuff (laughs) uh but i work in water and land solutions right now and we kind of exclusively focus on making sure that water sustainability will be achieved because of what sigma and sustainable groundwater management act is doing to california farming over the next 20 years so uh, I get to deal with sustainability issues every single day because that is the probably the single most influential piece of legislation that's going to affect every asset of our business every single day uh, because without water, it doesn't matter human capital, financial capital, how much we can produce anything. It's all limited. So for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, you know, for people listen that don't know me, you know, I didn't introduce myself. So I am um, involved with central irrigation, heavily involved there. And, you know, obviously all the irrigation we're doing now has everything to do with water conservation, getting the most crop that you can with the amount of water you have available 
and budgeting it. I also work very closely with Waterland Solutions and that team uh, because you know the infrastructure side and the mm -hmm. and their strategy and uh, um, uh, procurement of the water has everything to do with how we design and engineer things. Uh, I'm also um, involved with the Ag Center and been there since the beginning, working on developing, you know, our our marketing base and gathering all these great affiliate companies that have now created a really special team uh, and allows us to do fun things like this and talk about important issues like this. Yeah. You know, so, you know, the, the one thing we want to open with, I mean, I think everybody kind of knows, but I, I think it's important everybody hears your guys' perspective on, you know, why sustainability is important, you know, and I'll just open with what I think. And, you know, sometimes as a, you know, I'm, a, I'm from a farming family, is sometimes I take it uh, as a, as an insult that people think that farmers aren't sustainable, right? Because, um for us to continue to do what we love to do in this multi multi-generational business we have we have to think sustainable sustainably so if we you know don't uh, care for our ground if we don't conserve our resources then we won't be in business and i think uh you know most if not all farmers are very conscious of that yeah so you know leading with that i think farmers have every intention to be sustainable because that is you know what allows their kids and grandkids stay in business. And, and if you're not a farmer, if you're a business people, it's the same thing, right? We, yeah. we don't just do business to make money. We do it so we have something, um, a nest egg that we can pass on. And hopefully one of the kids are uh, ambitious and uh, hardworking enough to take it over, right? So why is it important, right? Obviously for us to um, continue to do what we love to do and, and meet these challenges and, and uh, be in business, we have to... Um, retain and um, conserve the resources we have so we can continue to do these things. And it's not just agriculture, but um, yeah, so we have to be very conscious of those things, but every sector has a different perspective on how and what mm -hmm. we have to do to do those things, you know? So, you know, in your eyes, Bo, you know, why is it so important um, in your guys' sector? I mean, you guys are heavily involved, obviously, uh, by doing solar, you know, mm -hmm. why, why do you think it's important to you and the, and the customers that you serve? Well, it, there's a couple things that come to mind. Uh, you know, the first thing is water availability, right? It's it. Every grower in the Central Valley isn't getting five, ten acre feet a year at all. I to, wish. Uh, you know, not even anywhere near that uh, to farm, right? Mm -hmm. No, you're not getting more than you need, right? You're right. getting getting less. So, solar has kind of fit into the area where a lot of growers are forced to run their deep wells, right? Majority of the time, it's very rare that you're going to get you know, enough ground, enough water from the canal to be able to, to be able to, to irrigate what you need to keep your trees healthy mm -hmm. or to run your operation. So what we're seeing a lot is a lot of growers who are forced into running a, your deep well the whole time, mm -hmm. right? And that's all that they have to be able to irrigate is the deep well. Well, as, as everybody knows, I mean, you know, 200 horsepower deep well is, is not the cheapest thing to do in the world. Yeah. So on our end, you know, we're seeing a lot of that where there's a lot of growers who, you know, are, are, they're, they're challenged by that, right? You're, you're, you're constantly running the deep well, which is extremely expensive to be able to be able to get water, which that's the biggest, the biggest hurdle we're seeing right now. And why where solar kind of plays into it is solar is able to offset that cost of running that deep well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one big thing in terms of what we're seeing, um, in terms of kind of back to what you had said about sustainability, is it's not something I think that the general public's aware of, right? Most people assume that that farmers were were you know were polluting the land and it's not we're not efficient. And I don't think people realize how much renewable energy agriculture actually uses. Right. Like I tell people that all the time, and I'm like, people, are, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do you know I do solar for agriculture. Like for ag, like farmer, like why? What do they do solar for? Like what? And I get that all the time, and I'm like, dude, like. You don't realize they like use the sun every like, day, yeah. <laughs> like you know what I mean. But the general public, with all due respect, they don't know any better. If you live in San Francisco or you live in in a big city or really anywhere, you you don't you don't know any better. You just think these guys are out here using all the water and doing mm -hmm. this and doing that, and you don't realize how much renewable energy actually plays a a role. You know, speaking about the new renewable energy, so do you have like you know obviously it uh, helps offset costs, but sure. as far as how it you know, helps the grid, which decreases the amount of demand coming from, you know, I, I, in, our, in our general area, there's a lot of, you know, hydroelectric sure. from the dams and stuff. But, you know, I know you might not have any figures, but when you're using solar, what, what are the type of energy sources that you're um, 
you know, decreasing demand from? You know, is it uh, biomass plants that are burning? Is it uh, fossil fuel, mm -hmm. you know, coal? Like, well, what are the types of uh, energy sources that you guys are now replacing by the solar grid that well, you guys are both, creating? Both, both that you, that you listed um, are, are key. So what happens is when the solar system's producing power, it's, it's, and not a lot of people know this, people think that the solar power is directly you know, running your operation. Most of the time, the solar energy is going back on the grid. Mm -hmm. And then the utility is crediting your, your account is how it works. So what's going on is when all that power is going back onto the grid, it's circulating, right? So sure. if, if my system's producing power and you're down the street next to me and it's all going onto the grid, right, it's, it's being used. So all of those things, right? By every, every type of fracking, every type of, you know, fossil fuel, it, it, it is, you know, replacing that. But the downside is, you know, at nighttime and during times when the solar is not producing power, that's where, you know, oftentimes you're, you are using, you know, fossil fuels and things right. like that is, you know, when the solar isn't working. Um, but when it is during the day, yeah, it's replacing. I'd like to make that point right there. So, you know, even though farmers can invest millions, tens, hundreds, billions of dollars into solar, mm -hmm. there's just a reality check that, you know, you can invest all that money, but you still have to have a... Yes another supply of energy. You have to. So Absolutely. going all in on green, right? We're seeing mm -hmm. this in Texas. Yep, yep. It's not realistic, at least right now, Absolutely. until they come up with other, some other type of technology. So that's something that's important for people to understand is everything sounds good yep. about solar, wind, green. but the reality is, is you get too dependent on that. You have an issue like you have in Texas, and now it's more expensive to get these right. other types of power plants back into. Absolutely. Um, so that's just an example of sustainability is a, a slippery slope where you know, you have to pick your battles and choose how deep you want to get into the green side of things because if you go too deep into it, right, you create other problems. Right. A lot, uh, and those other problems will be a lot more expensive to overcome, right? Absolutely. And that's something I want I wanted to, to talk on. I mean that's a that is a great point. While solar is awesome, while it offsets your costs, while it's a very, very clean way to produce power, it's not the magic bullet. Yeah. Right? You're still you still need to rely on fossil fuels and other forms a little bit to right. an extent. And like you said, it, it, these terminologies, these buzzwords get thrown around and people that don't understand them, you know, or people that don't, don't fully get it, right? It sounds, oh, solar, yeah, green energy, you know, the Green New Deal, it's, we're just gonna make everything solar. Well, what happens at nighttime when a hospital needs power? Right. What, what, how's a hospital, how's Valley Children's Hospital gonna get power at three in the morning when they need 100,000 kilowatt hours every- Well, they'd have to have a, a a battery the size of the hospital right next to it. <laughs> that's what I'm going, here's what I'm going towards, here's what I'm going towards is the battery technology right now. It's there, but it's not efficient enough to where I'd trust my life on it, right? A battery system, yes, can hold power and it can, it can, it can help those things, but it's not gonna, you know, if you're running a huge processing facility or something like, or anything that's, that has a, a big draw, right? A battery, a modern battery, yeah, it might be able to run you for a day. Yeah, it but it's, it's not going to get you very far. Yeah, not going to get you very far. Well, that's great. We're going to keep talking about that. But we got to keep yeah, moving yeah. here. So, you know, Mike, you know, so, you know, Mike's the one that I'm actually at all this. I'm the most interested, in, not because the other ones aren't important, but he's probably the one I know the least about, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I work with Josh, and I, you know, I work with Bo and does some solar myself, and quasi understand the energy, situ electricity grid. But I really wanted like to hear your your perspective mike on human resource and you know the challenges there and you know how that turns to sustainability because not everybody re it relates the word sustainability with human resource and i think that's a misunderstanding that um needs to be highlighted so yeah um well i mean i haven't been in it that long but even in the time that i have been in it we've seen a dramatic you know change or shift in the way things are done mm -hmm. so I, I feel that i got in it at the right time when the market was kind of changing in terms of labor and, and human resources so i mean the obvious is is well picking up what he said you know the magic bullet where everyone says there's machines to to do everything now you know to to pick up brush to harvest to shake and so on and so forth but right. at the end of the day you still need labor to you know, you need a guy on that machine, you know, right. and, and uh, even to the gust sprayers, you need someone to refill yeah, it and sure. so on and so forth. So uh, I would say the skill of the labor force now is, is is much higher than what it used to be back then. And when I, even when I say back then, we could talk about just 10 years ago right. compared to now. Um, I mean, it is a big issue and everything that goes on with water and, and uh, the sustainability over on ag affects labor, how much what our workforce is going to be at, what they're going to do. If guys decide on the west side to plant less tomatoes because 
they didn't get their allocation. Obviously, it affects us. It affects everybody. Right. Um, but uh, it's dramatically changed the landscape to a point where it's gone from, oh, yeah, I'm just going to hire a couple guys and I'll pay them at the end of the week and that's it, to, oh, my gosh, you know, there's so many HR laws. There's so many new regulations that I have to keep up with. I can't if, – if I'm forced to keep up with that, I really can't focus on – on what I'm doing, and that's right. the change we're seeing where guys are like, you know what, when it comes to labor, I have to bring in a professional now. I just can't have, you know, my old bookkeeper type the checks and, and right. you know, pay these guys. Yeah. Uh, there's been so many class action lawsuits, um, and that, so our demand for our business has gone up. So I guess that's a, in a, a good thing, at least. But, um, well, but overall, the, I think that's a testament to because, you know, like you said, it's becoming more challenging. So your business demand's gone up, but it doesn't, you know, the challenge of actually meeting that demand, I'm sure, is getting increasingly harder. Oh, yeah. We have to hire more staff, more support staff. You know, the uh, the amount of resources we have to take care of a client obviously increase once we do take on a new client, but by how much to make sure at least we're making a profit. Those are all little things that we watch for to make sure we're profitable at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. In your opinion, you know, so like you talk about some of this policy stuff and regulatory things, uh, HR, um, safety, you know, just all these labor rules that make it difficult. But from an actual labor supply, you know, human resource supply, qualified workers, technical skilled workers, in your eyes, what are the keys for that segment to be sustainable? All of us, right? We're all part of human resource in this room. So what are the keys going forward that you see that we need to focus on as an industry, um, even just as a society, right? What are the keys of making our human resource sustainable? And sustainable in this instance is is consistent, right? Uh, trained and reliable, and and you know fairly compensated. We all got to be fairly compensated. Yeah. You know, what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, number one, the obvious one that you know a lot of people don't like to talk about, but it is an issue is still immigration. You know, the truth right. is, you know the workforce is undocumented, mm-hmm. especially here in California, especially here in the Central Valley. Um, there are programs like H-2A to bring out, bring in outside labor, but it's very costly to house them, to transport them, to guarantee them, you know, their, their wage for the season that, that that's all built in. Um, but we do need a formal immigration plan. I know every single president's always said, the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, get right. an immigration plan going and then boom, it dies. You know, even yeah. Yeah. past few presidents have always said it. Um, and then the next thing is training the workforce, at least that we do have, to the new industry, you know, we're, we're taking guys that are used to weeding with a, with a hoe or with a shovel mm-hmm. to getting on a machine shaker and understanding how to use hydraulics and, and so on and so forth. Right. So we have little programs in our company where we take, you know, where we have our crews that, you know, these guys that prune, that do just general labor, and we try to pick and choose the ones that we think can go on a machine. You know, we try to test them in a certain way or just the way they act or the way they talk, and we're like, hey, we want you to come one day and... You know, we're going to drive you in a tractor and a training course. Right. Um, and from there, we're able to increase our labor pool and increase their skill set. So they're happy, we're happy, and our clients are happy. So everyone wins. Right. And that's and we can't keep up right now. We, we're basically having to do one every month mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be to meet the demand for what's going to be out there by harvest or by next year and the following year. Right. Well, that's extremely enlightening, right? So just in summary, um, you know, Mike's obviously very sharp and he knows it like the back of his hand, but... A clear path to being legally employed, right? Yeah. So that's number one, which I think we all in here agree. I think everybody, a lot of people here listening would agree. And number two, right, a clear path of how to train on these newer, more skilled type positions that are now taking the place of the older guard of, you know, hand labor, um, physical, you know, more of the... Oh, I, I just hard labor, right? It's just yeah, tough, yeah. it's just tough stuff. Hoeing weeds, picking things by hand, right? Um, you know, running rakes or whatever it is, right? Putting in tarps, running sprinkler pipe. So that's great. That's great for everybody to know because you know people don't look at it that right that way, right? The strawberries show up in the grocery store packed. No one thinks about how that happens. You know, no one thinks about um, you know how things get sorted or tractors get operated. Yeah. So. Um, that's very important for everybody that's listening that doesn't have that understanding of that's what if you go if there are things on the ballot or whatever and you can have some um, you can have your input by voting on something you know we do or getting behind politicians that are are that want to implement real immigration law and labor laws that are protecting the employee but also allowing the employee to be employed right because mm-hmm. the last thing you want to do is regulate our employees out of a job 
right? Because yeah. at a certain point, you know, businesses will have no choice, like Mike's saying, you know, buy robots and this and that. You still have to have your skilled employees, but there's a lot more people out there that need work than um, just the people that can, you know, run a computer that runs yeah. a robot. You know, one th real quick thing about the, the human, the person, like Elon Musk, you know, everybody knows he's all, you know, Tesla's going wild now, but when Tesla's about to go broke, right? Elon Musk was in uh, Fremont or wherever he's got his plant, and he was on the floor, on their assembly line floor, yep. and he had tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of robots. And he scrapped the robots and he replaced them with people because the people actually have the critical thinking to work through problems, and the robots were just too inconsistent. So that's just an example like what Mike was saying. Like, you still need that qualified person that can critically think and, and solve problems. Um, and those people in tandem with new technology is how we get things done. So yep. um, that's great, Mike. I really pre that's really good information. really appreciate it. So I'm going to keep moving here. And now we're going to go to Josh Dow, the, the ag water guy. Um, so like Josh said, he works in ag water resource and, um, and uh, works with water and land solutions. So, you know, in your opinion, Josh, you know, what are the things you're seeing and what do you think they're the important uh, key topics of, of why and how we can create sustainability within the ag water space? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, like, like I mentioned at the top, and uh, by the way, I appreciate the, the shameless plugs on the ag water guy. The, you're, you're welcome. I appreciate welcome. that. I just changed my Instagram. So. <laughs> uh, but no, I think the biggest thing right now, it, it is Sigma, it's the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And that is an important piece of legislation for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, we don't like it because it changes the very way that we do business, the way that farming operates in the valley. It's going to shift the entire kind of economic system of the valley in a way. But the good thing is there was going to come a point that if we didn't do something about this, I mean, California is one of the last states in the West to regulate groundwater, that we were going to go into a bigger problem of something that we couldn't come back from. Right. And portions of the valley would dry up, communities would dry up. Mm -hmm. So I think that it it has been put into place for a reason, and now we just need to figure out the best strategies to kind of work with the what we're given. And the good thing about farming is that, it, you know, ag's incredibly resilient. We've survived dust bowls, we've gone through the Great Depression, we've all moved out west, we've all moved back east. I mean, we are very tough human beings, but Water specifically, I mean, the big thing that you're seeing right now is if you're, you know, just a rough line, this, you know, Southern Stanislaus, Northern Merced County, down to Tehachapi, to Hone Ranch, down by the Grapevine, you, you know, GSPs, uh, a part of Sigma, have already been put in place. You're already starting to see kind of what your allocations will be every year until you hit your sustainable yield down in 2040. And in some places, I mean, that's less than a half acre foot right. per acre. So, we have to think really creatively on how do we upgrade infrastructure that hasn't been really worked with or messed with since 1980. That's reservoirs, canals. I mean, things like the aqueduct are coming into mind. How do you upgrade infrastructure to now meet demand of something that it was built for 40 years ago? Well, in 60 if we're in 2040. Uh, and how do you get that then that same thought process down to the local the local guy, the farmer that's got 100 acres of trees or the farmer that's been farming the same piece of ground out in the middle of Fresno County and has never relied on a surface water supply. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of interesting things that come about, and it's, it's exciting because it's almost creating new markets. And when I say creating new markets is we can now start seeing ways that we can buy and trade surface water. We're going to see ways that we can buy and trade groundwater credits within our sub-basins that are defined by Sigma. Um, so there's going to be ways that you get new operational flexibility coming through Sigma. Yes, it's uncertain. We don't like uncertainty. We don't know what we're headed towards. But I think it's going to be a defining point in kind of California's ag future. And I really think that it's important to note, you know, hey, don't be afraid of change because sometimes change can lead to unexpected opportunity. Right. Sure. And that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, and to add to your point, you know, it's like the really resilient community and the things that are already in motion right now that we're seeing, right? So you mentioned like uh, groundwater credit uh, exchanges or surface water uh, transfers, but the other thing that's already happening, right, is already, we're already looking at how to, how to um, solve the problem with groundwater recharge projects yep. that are already in place that we're – we've been involved with or know of or know people that are involved with, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's from a private level all the way up to a, you know, a public agency level with large, 
you know, large irrigation districts. And so that shows, you know, the resiliency and the effort for this whole sustainab for sustainability. This yep. is in, in this situation, it's sustainab sustainability through the water resource, you know, but that effort's already be going forward, right? And that's, this is all proactive effort, right? This yep. isn't, this isn't, this, the regulation hasn't really um, necessarily it even. It hasn't sunk its teeth. It hasn't come into effect. And they, and some things might be known, but not all things are known yet. But these people and agencies are already doing these things ahead of time yep. to help solve the problem, right? And so that's what's exciting. And that's what kind of shows the resilience, you know, of the ag industry is you, you have these massive projects where we're literally sinking tens of thousands of acre feet back into the ground, back into the aquifer to obviously supplement what we, what we need to use in farming or, you know, other, you know, municipal or industrial, but at, we're putting it back so that way we have the ability to use it in the future. Yeah, right? we, we have an insurance policy at that point. So yes, we're increasing sustainability, but I think the really important thing to note with recharge is that, I mean, you, you can talk climate change, you can talk about drought and all of these things. Recharge is an insurance policy against drought. If we have good recharge policies on farm at the agency level, we can take excessive flood water in wet years, put it in recharge basins, and then have a bank account that we can use in case of a rainy day. Right. And it's it's just it's nothing nothing bad comes from recharge. I right. think that's a pretty good way to say it. Not, not, a, not a rainy day. Not a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> not a rainy day. Well, that's only the, <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's good. Um, but yeah, you know, that just, and that just shows, right. And, and these are just the things that we figured out that we can do to like meet that issue now. I mean, you know, with the innovation and the progressive nature of the ag industry, we're going to find other ways, right. To solve that problem. And, um, you know, we're, like I said, central and, um, water and land solutions. We've worked together on projects to help some of these farmers or other agencies to, to help, uh, solve this problem. And, you know, hopefully we can continue to do that. Um, because like you said, Josh, you know, we, none of us like regulation when it costs us more money, to, mm -hmm. you know, increases our operating costs, but you have to look at it on the big picture that it's a necessary evil in order to be sustainable, yep. right? In order to continue. Um, one other thing, I mean, it doesn't, it kind of has to do with all of us here, but you know, Matt from Penny Newman was supposed to be here, but this is a plug for him. I know this <laughs> is something he would talk about a lot is, you know, we've talked about human resource, we've talked about water resource, we talked about energy, um, but, you know, one of the other things is, uh, which is a very key point to the another may, main, maybe the heart of agriculture is the soil, right? Mm -hmm. And and what has a lot to do with the soil is carbon. And that's another, you know, buzzword that's going around right now. And another way that farmers, which is starting now and I think will continue is, you know, carbon sequestration and carbon um, being carbon neutral or even even carbon negative, which is a positive, <laughs> you know, so, you know, so, something that, uh, farmers have the most potential of any industry, right. To sequester or absorb the most carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that happens through photosynthesis in plants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for the people out there that don't understand how this works, you know, a uh, plant takes in carbon dioxide and photosynthesizes it with sunlight and uses water. And that carbon actually ends up in the soil. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, Obviously, where are the most plants? You've got millions of acres of orchards, millions of acres of, of vegetable hay crops in California. So uh, another way that agriculture is pushing forward to be sustainable and also help our carbon situation is, is through a regenerative ag type process where we change the way we till things a little bit. We change the type of inputs that we're using. Uh, we change our practices so that way we release less carbon in the atmosphere and we sequester or we absorb more carbon into the soil, which the more carbon that we have in the soil, you know, the more uh, fertility, the more growth, the more tilth, the, the microbial populations and the beneficial bacteria and all those things in the soil do much better with a higher, a higher level of carbon in the soil, which is carbon in the soil is basically organic matter, right? Yep. So um, Places that, you know, people talk about virgin dirt. The reason why virgin dirt is so fertile and so great is that it has tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years of organic matter that's that's uh, aggregated in the soil, right? So, um, you know, we'll probably have another podcast to go more in depth about that, but I definitely want to touch about it because, you know, if you're talking about agriculture, you can do a lot with water, human resource or labor, mm -hmm. energy, 
um, and soil. You know, those are, I mean, obviously we need the sun, but um, those things, I mean, you can do pretty much any with, anything with those things. So mm-hmm. um, it's really exciting stuff. I mean, this, you know, we're running out of time here, but I, we wish, I wish we had more time to talk, really, you yeah. know, and maybe we do have to do another um, another one of these on the same subject because we really only had time for each one of you guys to kind of touch the tip of the iceberg on each segment. But I think the people listening should have a pretty good idea from what you guys have said. I mean, I, I really appreciate and uh, I'm fond of the words that you guys had said about your specific um, segments in the industry. And it should give the, the people listening a good idea about what sustainability means um, how ag is already pushing to meet that demand and how it is in our best interest and business interest to be sustainable for, for the future. And, um, you know, one of the closing things I wanted to say and is that, you know, there's a lot of negative, and this is something that Bo brought up earlier, there's a lot of negative public opinion towards agriculture, right? You know, where we got tractors that use diesel and we're, we're cow farts. Cow farts. <laughs> yeah. Cow farts. Cow farts. Yeah. You got Great met, minds. You got that. And you, you know, we're people, we work people too hard yeah. and, um, use we use all water, the water, you know, water. it's all these negative things, yeah. but you know, the reality is, is that any water that goes down our drain ditch, any, you know, employee that is being mistreated, any, any, you know, energy that we waste, it's just, it hurts us, right? You either have a disgruntled employee that doesn't want to perform. You got water that you paid for that ends up in the drain ditch. You've got energy you paid for that it's a bit, it ends up you paying PG&E or whoever. And, yep. and it's a waste of energy, right? 100%. Farmers don't like any type of waste. And if you know a farmer, you'll know that farmers do watch and they're very cost conscious. So, you know, the, the message here is that the agricultural community in general doesn't waste anything intentionally. And they are putting the efforts forward to be sustainable. It's just like the example that Bo made about solar not being able to be the silver bullet to energize the world, right? We're trying to meet that sustainable demand and need while being able to stay in business and stay productive yep. and uh, be able to produce the things that we need to to stay in business and you know supply the demand that there is on the, on you know for people to eat, for people to drink, whatever it is, right? So I think that's an important message that all the listeners listeners understand about the ag community. Um, and, you know, I, I want to thank you guys for showing up, Josh, Mike, Bo. Um, like I said, I wish we had some more time, but it was oh, really good. we can good. always come back. Yeah, we, we can always come back. We can always come back. Yeah. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed talking with you guys. So one more plug again. Mike with Pacific Farm Management, if you guys need anything out there, I mean, he pretty much does everything, you know, from anything that has to do with uh, – labor all the way to materials, you know, planting, marking, development, yeah. development any, anything that has to do with it. W- one more thing. Oh. I didn't know Doug takes vacations, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, know, yeah, yeah. I forgot yeah. to bring that yeah, up. Yeah, if you ask Doug, he doesn't take vacations until you call him and he's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I didn't yeah. say it, Doug, all right? I didn't say it. I don't know uh, what you're talking about. He's training. Yeah, yeah I'd, like to th- I'd like to thank Bo from Barrier Solar for being here. You know, uh, I can say from a... From experience, call Bo, he'll take care of you. They figure it all out, man. They have everything in-house. Uh, start to finish, they'll, they'll, they'll get it done for you. And then Josh, the ag water guy, uh, always appreciate what you have to say and uh, looking forward to the things you got coming up in the future. Yeah. And all these guys, I, I know, well, some of you guys will only listen to this, but others that are viewing it, you'll see. Everybody here is pretty young, so we're all looking to uh, lead the next generation and and um, do the best we can in ag. So with that, guys, we gotta um, we got to do a toast. and. Alright, test the sustainable ag. Sustainable ag. Yeah, he's already got water. There you go. Yeah.